Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry for the delay there. There was a little tech glitch. But listen, today I'm here to share with you my top 10 freight broker cold calling tips for 2024. Okay, so that's what we're going to go over today. Today, I want to share some tips with you that are going to help you to get more shippers because we all know cold calling, as painful it is, is as it can be, is a necessary evil, right? So you need to take advantage of some of these tips. Some of the things I've learned in my past that have really smoothed the process and have really expedited the process of getting customers with cold calling. So that's what we're going to talk about today. 10 Freight Burger cold calling tips. <clears throat> Thank you for joining me. Truly appreciate it. Uh, I have been very hit and miss the last month with these lives and I apologize. I had a death in the family. I've been sick. Uh, I was actually sick again. Uh, I don't know what's going on. This has been a rough winter for me. Normally, I'd only get sick once or once or once a year, once every other year. But this year, I'm just getting my butt kicked. So in any event, I'm here, and I want to thank you for joining me. Do me a huge favor. Hit me up in the comments with the city and state you're logging in from. I'd love to hear from you. So hit me up in the comments. I'll give you some shout outs. Um, the agenda is this. We're going to do the training. Then depending upon time, we may do a free giveaway, maybe a Freightpreneur t-shirt or some cash, you know, someone who solves problems you don't know you have in ways you can't understand. And then uh, third, we're gonna, last but not least, we're going to do live Q&A. We could talk about anything freight broker related, freight broker, freight agent related, whether it's startup or marketing or sales or operations or hiring or agent model or whatever you want to talk about, we can do live Q&A at the end. Okay, so that's where we're at. I'm going to give a few shout outs and then we're going to get the ball rolling here in just a minute. Uh, welcome, Diane from Little Rock, Arkansas. Welcome, Randy. Welcome, Jason from Olivia, Minnesota. Welcome, Harvey from Hector, Arkansas. Cynthia from Maryland, as always. Welcome. Shaka from Hope Mills, North Carolina. First, last from Salt Lake City. Randy from Little Rock. Jason Blacken from Sheboygan, Sheboygan, <laughs> Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Davit from Armenia, welcome. Ahmad from Pakistan. Jomo Mighty from, I know he's from Florida. He didn't put that in there, but thank you so much. Carnelile, uh, Carnelile from Sacramento, California. Angela from Glen Burns, Maryland. Christopher from Baltimore. Corey from Billings, Montana. John from Pittsburgh. Ahmed from Pakistan. Thank you so much. Isabella from Bronx, uh, Bronx New York. Felicia from Phoenix. Sebastian from Med Medellin, Colombia. Man, we've got people from Colombia, Pakistan, uh, where, uh, Armenia. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? we got people from all over the world. It's really funny because, you know, a while ago, I kind of took a look at the, the students that have went through my Freight Broker Bootcamp Startup Program. That's where I teach you from A to Z how to get started as a Freight Broker Freight Agent in 30 days or less. You can check that out at FreightBrokerBootcamp.com. But I went through and <clears throat> it's well over 10,000 students that have went through that program. But at my last count, it was over 16 different countries that have went through that program. So students from 16 different countries have went through that program. So that's, that's pretty cool. So, you know, places like Australia and, and, uh, and uh, the UK and Germany and, and um, man, all over Italy and Colombia and, Places, places, some places I've never even been, many places I've never even been, but I do appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much. Today, we are going to cover top 10 cold calling tips for 2024. These are tips that if you just listen, you will get absolutely zero out of. I'm being upfront with you, but if you listen and then you take action and then you implement what I'm sharing with you into your cold calls, into your sales efforts, just one of those tips could mean tens of thousands of dollars in your pocket, okay? So here's my notes. I got a lot of notes, okay? A lot of notes here to go over. <clears throat> 10 tips, and we're going to give it about one more minute for people to get live, and then we will get the ball rolling. Listen, the price of admission is this. I didn't ask you for a credit card. You didn't have to go through any rigmarole to get here. This is a free live training. So the price of admission is right now, hit the like button and share the stream. Do me a favor. I really appreciate it. We don't do a lot of paid advertising. Nine out of 10 people that sign up for our course find out it through word of mouth, right? And through the internet. So yeah, do me a huge favor, share the stream. Greatly appreciate it. 
And um, we're going to, again, we're going to get the ball rolling here in just a minute. We got a couple more shout outs and then we'll get going. Sunset from, wait, where is it? Uh, there we go. All right, cool. So that's it. All right. So let me just take a quick look, make sure I've got everything in place here. Grab a quick drink and then we are going to get going. Okay. So hold tight. And here's the cool thing. If you stick around to the end, I'm actually going to give you a chance to download this cheat sheet. These are my actual notes that I took that I'm doing this training from. So these are the notes that I'm doing the training for. If you guys want a copy of those, stick around to the end because I'll give you a link where you guys can actually download this whole thing. All right. But you got to stick around to the end. <clears throat> all right. So here we go. Today, I want to share with you my top 10 freight broker cold calling tips that are going to help you to get more clients. All right. So I'm going to dive right in, but here's what I want to preface this with. I know how painful cold calling can be. I have admitted it publicly that I hate cold calling. If I have a choice, I prefer not to cold call. But as a freight broker startup, I'll be extremely honest with you. You are going to have to make some cold calls. You're going to have to do some cold emails. You're going to have to do some cold outreach, right? Maybe even face-to-face. -face. These tips that I'm about to share with you today will definitely improve your results, decrease your stress, and overall be way more profitable for you, all right? So here we go. Number one on the list. Again, there are going to be 10. And then if you stick around to the end, I'm actually going to give you a bonus tip and I'm going to give you a link where you can download my notes, the cheat sheet for the um, for these top 10 tips, okay? So number one in the list is this. You have to project confidence and enthusiasm, okay? I'm going to give you two examples. When I'm talking right now, I'm standing up, my chest is out, my head is up. I'm speaking in a tone that shows my passion. I'm speaking in a tone that shows my confidence. I'm speaking confidently. I'm projecting confidence. The opposite of that, of this, is what I sometimes hear from new people when they're making their first cold call. They go like this. Uh, hey, hello, Mr. Jones. Uh, um, my name is, um, and I was just curious if, uh, and you, do you hear that? They're mealy-mouthed, and it just shows the total lack of confidence confidence and preparation. Okay. So number one on the list, you have to convey confidence and you have to speak confidently. Now, if you can't speak confidently, then you need to get to the point where you can. All right. I understand. So that's number one, project confidence and enthusiasm. It's infectious and it sells. Okay. Number two, use a cold call script as a guide, but not a crutch. The fact is, having a script is fine. Scripting out your cold call is a good idea as a framework, as a guide to help you navigate the cold call. But it can't be a crutch. You can't sit here on the phone and read it word for word like, while having a script can be helpful, avoiding sounding robotic or reciting it verbatim. See, you can't sound like you're reading from a script. Having it as a guide is fine, and it's absolutely smart. You should have a guide. You should have a script. Until you've done that cold call and it's committed to your memory, it's ingrained in your brain, okay? If you haven't done it hundreds of times, you should have that script in front of you, but don't read it verbatim. It's just a guide. It's not a crutch. That's number two. Number three, this is an important one, so lean in. This is something that a lot of people don't understand. You have to gather sales intelligence. Now, sales intelligence, I may have shared this with you before. You may have heard this before, but the fact is sales intelligence is any data that you can collect prior to your outreach, okay, that enhances your opportunity to get the sale. So what do I mean by that? You can do gather sales intelligence from the company website by knowing what type of products they sell, by knowing what type of equipment they're going to need, what type of services they're going to need, by looking at the press releases and recent news related to their industry, going on LinkedIn and finding out who the shipping manager is or director of logistics, and then gathering some sales intelligence about them personally and professionally. 
Um, there's lots of ways to gather sales intelligence. My three favorite are Google, LinkedIn, and the company website. If you use those three, it'll literally take you three to five minutes. You'll be armed with all kinds of information, all kinds of data that you can then leverage to show your knowledge and your competency when calling your prospect. In addition, it's going to come in later in one of my future tips. So hold tight for that. All right. So that's number three. Number four, craft a compelling sales hook. All right. So here's the thing, right? The secret to success in cold calling is this. You have to get their attention. And in order to get their attention, you can't sound like everybody else. All right. If you sound like everybody else, you're going to get treated like everybody else. And you're going to go into that. I'm not interested bucket. But if you sound different, not only with your tone and with your enthusiasm, but if the words you say are different than what they've been hearing every day, day in and day out throughout their career, then you have an opportunity to get their attention. So creating a compelling sales hook is where you're going to use some of that sales intelligence that I just talked about. You're going to use some of that sales intelligence and you're going to create an interesting and compelling opening that differentiates you from the crowd. You have to get their attention. That's critical because if you don't get their attention, there's no chance to get to discovery or overcoming rebuttals or, or freight quotes or any of that. So you have to get their attention. Uh, creating a compelling sales hook is a huge part of my freight broker sales accelerator. Okay. My freight broker sales accelerator is where I take that piece of my brain. It's a freight broker sales coaching program where I take that piece of my brain and I teach you everything I know about freight broker sales, strategy, tactics, tools, but most importantly, my entire system of how to do freight broker sales that allowed me to do over $200 million as a freight broker. I'll put the link here up on the screen so you guys can check that out. You can join the waitlist. Now it's sold out right now. You can enroll. But if you want to get on the waitlist, go to freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash waitlist. Okay. You can get signed up there. You'll be the first to be notified when I open up the sales accelerator, it'll probably open up in the next month or two, depending upon demand. So get on the wait list. It's absolutely free to get on the wait list. It is not a free program. It is a paid coaching program where I teach you everything I know about my best free broker sales strategies, tactics, and tools. So you guys can check that out. All right. All right. So number five, you need to target the decision makers, but don't ignore influencers. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean social media influencers. I mean influencers within the organization that you're prospecting. The fact is back in the day, decisions were made with by one or two people in a corporate environment. Okay. That was very common. There was one or two people that were making those decisions, but now uh, data shows us that those decisions are being made amongst a larger group of not only the titled decision makers, but actual influencers within that organization. So gatekeepers and subordinates and even low level, uh, you know, administrators. And, and so perfect example, like uh, beyond just the shipping manager or director of logistics or VP of logistics, everybody in that chain from the top dog down from VP of logistics to director of logistics to the shipping manager to the logistics coordinator to the guy that loads the dock, right, on the dock. Every one of those people has influence on the decision. So while you want to get to the decision maker, along the way, don't ignore the influencers, right? Don't ignore the other layers. Try to build it, a friendship, try to develop an ally and then leverage that to enhance your opportunities, okay? All right, number six, focus on benefits, not features. Okay, I can't say this enough. Buyers do not buy features. Features do not sell. Benefits sell, okay? So the reality is you have to understand, you're not selling features, right? Feature, like give me an example, I'll give you an example. Um, a feature is we give you online tracking so that you can track your loads. That's a feature, okay? The benefit to them is that they know where their freight is at any given point in the supply chain 
so that we can make adjustments as needed to fit their needs. Do you see the difference? Feature versus benefit, okay? Right, so that's what you have to understand. Features don't sell, benefits sell. So you have to focus your conversations, focus your dialogue around the benefits you can provide them. Don't talk about features, it really doesn't matter, okay? All right, number seven, ask insightful questions. All right, so this is one that salespeople struggle with. And the reason why they struggle with asking good questions is because they talk too much, right? They vomit all over their prospects. They make it all about them. And then the prospect simply says, I'm not interested and exits stage left. But the reality is, as a salesperson, you should listen twice as much as you talk. And one of the key ways to do that is to ask good questions, ask insightful questions, ask questions, um, for example, you know, about their current shipping experiences, their pain points, their desires, the things that they, you know, some of the challenges that they're having. Um, ask them questions like that that will allow you to do two things. Number one, gather more sales intelligence because if you ask them a question and you listen, they will tell you what they need. And then secondly, by doing that, you are demonstrating your ability and willingness to create a custom solution for them, okay? So it'll also show your professionalism and your knowledge. By asking good questions, you actually show your knowledge. You don't downplay your knowledge, okay? So that's number seven. Number eight, I just said it. I gave it away as an early tip here. Listen twice as much as you speak, okay? That is a huge problem that salespeople have. They vomit all over their prospects. And then the prospect, you know, I, I liken it to this. You walk into a room, a dark room, all right? No, you walk into a room and it, actually that's a bad analogy. Let's, let's not use that one. But, but the point is, is that you need to listen twice as much as you speak. So if you find yourself dominating the conversation and trying to drag the conversation along, then you have then you have to make an adjustment in your sales presentation. You have to have use some of these earlier tips like gather sales intelligence and create a compelling sales hook and ask good questions. These are all ways that you can start listening twice as much because again, if you listen carefully to what the prospect says, many times that can lead to understanding exactly what you need to do in order to get their business, okay? All right, so number 9, anticipate common objections. Okay. So here's the reality. At some point in the process, you are going to get an objection. You're going to get a no. You're going to get some negative feedback on virtually every single sales call, even the ones that end up as a customer. You're going to need to anticipate what those objections are, and you're going to need to practice how to overcome those objections. You'll have, you should have a framework on how to overcome the, at least the four most common objections. The four most common objections are, we're happy with our current provider. Your price is too high. We don't use brokers. Or just send me some info. That's a blow off, but I consider it an objection. Okay? So those four things are what you're going to, or the facsimile thereof, are the four things you're going to hear most often. And you need to know how to handle those. You need to know how to break those down. You need to know how to overcome those. And you need to anticipate them on every single call, okay? Because you're going to get them, all right? Number 10, you need to embrace objections as opportunities. So remember, we just talked about anticipating the objections, but now you have to actually embrace them. Your goal is to bring out objections, okay? So that you can talk about them because those are really opportunities. Here's what we know. Um, very few people, literally like probably one out of a thousand, are you going to pick up the phone? They're going to pick up the phone. Everything's going to go perfect. And they're going to tell you they want to do business with you without an objection on the first call. It's probably worse than one out of a thousand. Okay. I don't know the numbers, but it's really, really bad. So the reality is you have to start looking at objections as opportunities, right? Objections, because what you know is if you can break down that objection and you can overcome that objection with the prospect, you're one step closer to getting and earning their business. 
So the reality is you need to embrace objections as opportunities, okay? So that's number 10. And here's the bonus. Who wants a bonus tip, okay? I'm going to give you a bonus tip, number 11. This is one that I see people, a mistake that I see brokers and agents making all the time. It's a huge, huge mistake. You guys want to hear it? Okay, so listen. The bonus tip is this. Always define your next steps. So what do I mean by that? Before you get off the call with the prospect, you have to define not only for you, but for them and clearly identify what the next steps are. Your goal should be before you get off that call to schedule the next call. So it might be a scheduled call. It might be an email follow-up to answer a question. It might be a freight quote. It might be a face-to-face me -face meeting. But the reality is you have to define before you get off that cold call the next step. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We have a great call with a prospect and everything seems to be going well. And then the next thing you know, I send them an email. And then the next thing you know, I've called him five times over the next week and he's not picking up the phone and he's not responding to my emails. Now, what's the reason for that? There could be a variety of reasons. He could have been blowing smoke at you and that he's really not interested. Uh, it could be he's very busy. It could be he's out of work. It could be he got fired. It could be um, any number of reasons why he's not responding to you. But the fact is, had you defined the next step, had you defined the next action, right? Had you scheduled a call, your next call, before you got off that call, you would have exponentially increased your odds of connecting with them again and moving that sale forward, okay? So that's the bonus step. So listen, um, I hope you guys enjoyed these 10 tips. If you did, do me a huge favor in the comments. Let me know on a scale of one to 10, one being, Dennis, this was terrible. This is horrible. You suck to 10, meaning, hey, I absolutely love this, particularly tip number four or tip number seven or tip number nine. Let me know your feedback in the comments. Truly appreciate it. And listen, if you guys are curious about becoming a freight broker or a freight agent, hit me up at freightbrokerbootcamp.com. We've trained over 10,000 students. We've had that program for well over a decade. I have personally done over $200 million as a freight broker, and we offer a 60-day, 100% unconditional money back guarantee. So you can check that out at freightbrokerbootcamp.com. If you guys want to get on the wait list for the next Freight Broker Sales Accelerator, just go to freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash wait list. Have an awesome day. I'll see you next week on the next Freight Broker Bootcamp Live. All right. So if you guys want to hang around for the Q&A, hold tight. Okay. Hold tight for the Q&A. That was a lot of information. I did forget to give you the, uh, <laughs> I did forget to give you the cheat sheet download. All right. So if you guys want access to this cheat sheet, all you got to do is go to freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash cold, C O L D. Again, if you want the top 10 freight broker cold calling tips, all you got to do is go to freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash cold. You'll be able to download it for free and you'll get instant access to my notes. So you didn't have to review, you know, you didn't have to scribble them down on paper. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Again, um, I'm going to grab a quick drink. I'd love to hear your guys' feedback. I'm going to check in the comments, some of the feedback, what your favorite tips were, which ones you thought were valuable. Okay, cool. Let's see. We got Larry Bowen says, loved it. Alexandra says, 10. Uh, Alex is ready to get started. My boy, Nate, 10. Uh, Yep. Let's see. What the heck? Hold on a second. All right, cool. Let's see what else we got. Diane, 10. Cynthia Moore, 10. Angela, thank you. Listen, thank you so much. And listen, if there's a way that I can improve these trainings, just let me know. I'm not egotistical enough to think that I can't improve or get better. So hit me up with comments. If if I, if it wasn't an eight, nine, or 10, and you really thought this sucked, let me know. But give me some constructive feedback. That's all I'm looking for. I want to deliver for you 
listen, I've already been fortunate enough to go through this process. I've already started, grew, and then sold a successful freight brokerage. Now it's time for me to help you, but I want to customize the training in such a way that it works for you. Okay. So let me grab a quick drink. Corey 10, thank you so much. And the cheat sheet will be extremely valuable. Again, freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash cold, C-O-L-D. I can't make it any easier than that. All right. Yes, it is, Jomo. Confidence is the key, my friend. You know, you got to have confidence and you got to convey confidence and you got to display confidence and you got to sound confident. My secret hack for sounding confident is really simple. Don't sit down when you sell. Stand up when you sell. I was actually going to put that in as a tip, but standing up when you sell opens up your chest, puts your shoulders back, gives you the ability to move around and not get stagnant. You're going to have more oxygen. You're going to have physically, you feel more powerful. And then that will come through in your voice. Notice how I stand every time I do these videos. You don't see me sitting. Okay. I've got a torn ACL right now, not to divert from the topic, but I have a completely ruptured ACL on my left knee. I did it about three, four weeks ago and it's getting better but I'm standing this whole time. I could easily come up with an excuse to sit down, but the delivery would not be the same. Okay. So stand up when you're selling. That's my hack. I've probably shared that in the past for sounding more confident. Okay. And, and sounding more empowered, and enthusiastic. Okay. So thank you so much for that. Okay. All right, cool. So uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. what time is it? Oh shit, it's getting late. Okay, let's um, let's not do a giveaway today. We'll do one next week. Matter of fact, if you guys want a to be a part of a giveaway, what is that? What's the I'm trying to think of? I don't think I created a short link for it. No, I didn't. Dumber. If you guys are following me on TikTok, okay. There's actually a contest uh, where I'm giving away a thousand bucks. I'll send it out. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. Next week, okay? I don't want to divert from where we're at. All right. So if you guys have questions, all right, you want to do some live QA, type your questions in the box. You can ask about freight broker startup or marketing or sales or operations or hiring or agents or something that's going on inside the industry or whatever it is that your challenge is, whatever it is your obstacle is, whatever it is you need help with. Hit me up in those comments and let me know. And I will do absolutely do my absolute best to try to answer those questions for you. Again, thank you all so much for the feedback. I really appreciate it. Uh, question from Randy Clifton. How do you get them to share pain points when trucks are plentiful and they're not struggling covering their freight? Well, there's more pain points than just capacity. There are more pain points than just rates. Okay? So... Shippers, some of the most common ones are obviously capacity, rates, picking up and delivering on time, right? Liability from vetting carriers, double brokering, double brokering fraud, right? Those sorts of, so there's lots of other pain points. I would tell you that you should know the majority of the pain points or you should know the most common pain points for your prospect for their industry, for your niche. You should have already done a lot of that research, right? But as you are in the conversation with them, you know, you can inject some of those pain points. I know a common, you know, so for example, you might say something like, you know, Randy, I know a common pain point for companies like yours when trucks are tight is having the capacity to um, cover your freight in a timely manner. But I don't really want to talk about that right now unless that's an issue. I don't think that's an issue for you right now. Let me ask you a question. What was one of the most recent pain points or challenges you faced uh, in your role as a shipping manager? So you simply ask them, right? So, but you frame it. You don't just say, hey, what are your most common pain points? You frame it and use your knowledge of what their pain points are to package it in such a way that it shows that it's a thoughtful intelligent, educated question. So that's a, just an example of how you might segue into asking what their most recent pain points are. That's just one example. Hope that helps. 
does it first last says, does it make sense to try to get more clientele without having a media presence or should I hire someone to manage that before reaching out to potential clients? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by media presence, but here's what you're going to need as a freight broker startup. Here's two things I would strongly suggest you have as a freight broker startup. One is a website. It's very inexpensive to set up a website. You can set it up for hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. A website with, on your, your domain with your brand and with all your contact information there, okay? And all everything about you, that brochureware, we'll call it, okay? The second thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set up a LinkedIn profile for you and for your company, okay? Now, the reason why you want to have those set up is this. I'm going to give you scenario A and scenario B. Scenario A is you start making cold calls and you start doing outreach to prospects before you set up your website or LinkedIn. And then what happens, you get on the phone with a prospect and the prospect is maybe somewhat interested or maybe really interested, okay? Maybe they want to do business with you. But the next thing they do is they go online and they search for your company and they can't find your company anywhere. They can't find it on LinkedIn. They can't find it on Google. And if you can't find a business on one of those two, that business is irrelevant. And it, it totally sets up a red flag to that prospect. And I promise you, if someone's going to do business with you, they are going to vet you on Google or LinkedIn before they ever stroke you a check. Okay? I promise that's going to be the case. 98 out of 100 times. So you want to set up a website, a basic website. It doesn't need to be a $5,000 website. You get away with probably 500 or less. Uh, matter of fact, if you're part of the Freight Broker Bootcamp, we, we have templates, right? And we have an entire system where you can use those templates, customize those templates, and get a website up for probably 50 bucks or less, okay? So yeah, um, you definitely want a website and you definitely want LinkedIn pro personal profile and a business profile, okay? So those are the two things you want to do. I would not spend the money on trying to use some sort of social media manager or some sort of media company, you know, unless you just want to throw away money, these are things that you could easily do yourself. You don't need an outside party to do that. Joe Momighty says, how do you follow up after you sent your info to a shipper? Okay, so let me tell you how not to follow up, okay? And then I think that will help clarify how you should follow up. Here's what you should not do in a follow-up call or email. Hey, Jomo, just touching base. Hey, Jomo, just checking in. Hey, Jomo, just trying to see if you got my email. Did you read my email? Right? Those are very weak follow-up strategies. Matter of fact, take all of those out of your vocabulary. And if you never use them again, you will be ahead in the game. So how do you follow up? You follow up depending upon where you are in the process, okay, or what the situation has been. But if you had a phone call with somebody and then you should, again, like I said before, you should be, my bonus tip is always to find your next step. So if you agree you're going to have a scheduled call, then obviously you've got that defined schedule call. If you agree you're going to send them an email, then you're going to have that email. So it's easy to follow up with those prospects. The reason why you're struggling to follow up is because you did not define what your next step was. You sent them an email and then you just kind of left it to the gods, hoping that they were going to reach out to you and want to do business with you. And that's just not going to happen very often. So again, the fortunes in the follow up, you need to determine if you send that email what then, right? Can we get on a schedule call? What's the next step? When should I follow up with you? I don't want to step on your toes. So defining that next action will prevent a lot of that, okay? But those tips that I gave you at the beginning about just touching base, um, just checking if you got my email, um, just checking in, those sorts of things, get rid of those, all right? What I do, if a lead has went cold, okay? Say something happened and they missed a call, right? We had a scheduled call and they missed that call for whatever reason or he had to get rescheduled or whatever. And we just didn't connect after that initial call for whatever reason, okay? We'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll assume that it was for a good reason. Probably not, but we'll assume that it was a good reason. Um, what you do then is you use the sales intelligence that you gathered prior to call 
and you use the sales intelligence you gathered on that call to create a compelling hook that you can then reel them back into the process so that you can then reignite that sales process, okay? So if you were talking about the, their biggest challenge being, um, you know, they just, they're concerned, they're reevaluating their freight broker, wh whether they're going to bring any new freight brokers because, I'm just coming up with a hypothetical, because a load was just recently double brokered and it caused all these problems, then you can use that as your entry point back in, right, to having that conversation. If you were talking about, for example, let's say you were talking on a more personal level with the prospect and you'd had a really good conversation and you were talking about, um, you know, one of their hobbies or one of their interests like cars or golf or the UFC or football or baseball. You can use that as the entry point back in, right? So use something interesting and compelling. Don't use just checking in. Don't use, um, you know, uh, just touch and base. Don't use any of those. Use the sales intelligence you gathered before the call and during the call to create a new hook to re-engage that conversation. Hope that helps. All right. Brandon has a question. Is it wise to ask for the shipping manager at shipper receiver? Okay. Um, I'm currently a truck driver. I go to several different companies. Question, is it wise to ask for the shipping manager at the shipper receiver? Well, if you're a freight broker or if you're a truck driver right now and you're looking to transition into becoming an agent or a broker, part-time or full-time, yes, you want to meet as many people as you possibly can during that process while you're a driver. So that means in the past, current, and future, every time you get an opportunity to meet uh, someone that's loading the freight on the dock, a shipping manager, a warehouse manager, a traffic manager, a load planner, whoever it is, you want to try to get their card if they have a card, right? You want to try to give them your card if you have a card. But more importantly, you want to make a good first impression. OK, much like this cold call, but it's not cold because you're picking up or delivering to their to their facility. So it should be pretty easy, unlike a cold call. So, um, yeah, you want to be memorable and you want to gather that information. You want to keep all that data. And then when you migrate into your own brokerage, your own agency, you can leverage that data, that information, those relationships, those connections to launch your business. So, yeah, I hope that helps. All right, what other questions you guys got? Hit me up. I hammered those ones out pretty quick. We still got a little bit of time. So, oh, okay. So Brandon says, didn't want a conflict of interest. Okay, well, Brandon, that would only be defined by you. If you have a conflict of interest, then you have to make the decision on how you're going to handle that. I'm not one to, you know, I'm not the morality police and I'm not a lawyer, right? Um, so you've got to make that judgment. If you've agreed to something, you know, you're if you've agreed to, for example, not, not back solicit uh, a shipper, okay, then you have to look at the terms that you agreed to and you have to abide by those terms unless you're willing to roll the dice uh, and pay the pay the price, right? So I'm not I'm not here again. I'm not the morality police. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not here to give you legal advice. But um, yeah, that that would be something. Having those relationships is not against your uh, whatever no back solicitation. Okay, having those relationships is not have is not an issue. Um, maybe soliciting that freight could be the issue. So when you're in there as a truck driver, you're not going to want to solicit their necessarily solicit their freight and say, Hey, I've got a brokerage or I want to redirect your, your, uh, your, your uh, business to someone else. But think about it. If you're picking up at a receiver, there's always a, if you're picking up at a, a, a shipper, there's always a receiver, right? So you're probably only limited to one side of that. So you might be able to pursue the other side of that equation. So that's something to think about. <laughs> what about grain elevators? I have no idea. What's the question? <laughs> you got to be more specific, buddy. I don't know. 
<laughs> I'm not a grain elevator ex, uh, expert, so I can't sit up here and just talk about grain elevators. What is it you specifically are looking for? All right. Samara asks, when do you think rates will start rising? Because that will help shippers start shopping around for new brokers. Okay. So the dynamics that determine rates are supply of trucks compared to the supply of loads. So it's supply and demand. If there are a lot of trucks and not very many loads, then rates go down because there's a lot of competition for trucks for those loads. If there's more loads than there are trucks, then rates go up because there's more competition for trucks. Okay, very simple dynamic. It's economics 101. Truck drivers, truckers, shippers, brokers do not determine the rates. They have limited at best influence over the overall rates, okay? So when rates go up, okay, that's a reflection of more demand for trucks. So the, what we just went through in 2023 was a capacity correction. There was too many trucks. We had freight go down and the number of trucks had went up and it was a perfect storm and it caused rates to go down right? Rates have stabilized now because there's more of a truck to load equilibrium. If you look at the country as a whole, right? So trucks are, are available now, right? There was a time back in 2021, 22, you couldn't even find a truck in certain lanes. You know, you'd have to pay through the nose to find a truck um, because you'd have to deadhead them in two or three hundred miles away in order to get in and even take the load, right? And competition was high for trucks. So now there's more of an equilibrium. And so, Rates will go up, right? But here's the thing. Um, I agree with you that turbulence creates opportunity. So as demand goes up and rate goes up, it's going to create more opportunity for brokers. The same way as when rates went down, believe it or not, there's opportunity when rates are going down just as much as when opportunities are going up. You just have to position yourself properly. So I can't tell you when rates are going to go up. I'll give you my I'll give you my personal prediction. Okay, I believe that we've already started to see rates re stabilize and recover. Uh, it's an election year. Um, I think that you know by Q2 um, we're going to start seeing rates rise, and by Q3, Q4 I think rates are going to go right into holiday season and they're going to rise up now. I can't predict the future. I'm giving you my personal opinion, but here's the reality. As rates start to rise, there will be opportunities because you will have less capacity, right? And you will have the current providers having to raise their rates to meet, to meet demand, right? To, to provide the demand and to provide the capacity. So there could be a great opportunity there. I love the fact that you're thinking about it that way because that, but I wouldn't wait OK, I wouldn't wait for that. And one of the things that you can do prior to rates going up is you can use that as a sales hook. OK, so here's how you use it as a sales hook. Perfect example. Hey, Joe, I know rates have been pretty stable after a big decline in 2023. So the fact is, there's only two things that are going to happen throughout 2024. The rates are going to go up or the rates are going to go down. If the rates go down, you're probably going to be okay. You may lose some carriers because they may not be able to survive. But the reality is if rates go up, what is your plan? How can you prevent having a disruption or issue related to a tighter, tighter capacity? So then you start that conversation. Do you see how I leveraged it? Right? I turned that into a positive because now we have that conversation and then Based on how he responds, he or she responds, I then fit myself into that conversation. Perfect example. Hope that helps. Akash says, if you're struggling to get your first official load after onboarding paper, what would you recommend to get the deal to finish line and running that first load? Okay, let me read that a question. Again, if you're struggling to get the official first load after onboarding paperwork, what would you recommend to get the deal to the finish line running that first load? Okay, so here's the problem. 
you've went through the pro the sales process with a shipper. They have exchanged paperwork. You're now set up as a vendor. You've probably provided some freight quotes. I'm going to put some texture to this, okay? But now you haven't gotten your first load. So there's a couple things you need to do that you should have done prior to, the, to that that would have helped you to understand the answer. One is when you're quoting on lanes, you want to understand um, what their demand is, what their, how many loads they're shipping. Are they shipping this lane every day, every week, every month? Is it a project that's three months down the road? What, is, what are the terms of this lane, right? What does this lane look like? What is the frequency, all right? So you want to understand that during the quoting process. You want to gather that information. Someone asks you how frequent, you know, someone asks you to give a quote from A to B. One of your first questions is, great, what type of demand do you hear? What's the frequency? Is this a daily movement, weekly movement? Quarterly, is this a project down the road? What does this look like? And then you gather that information. Now you need to know how to follow up, right? So if you get, if you get those questions prior to that, then you'll be able to fill in the blanks a lot easier, okay? Um, but the biggest problem that freight brokers have after they get onboarded as a shipper is they stop selling. They stop providing value. They stop um, being different. They stop being compelling, right? They feel like, oh, they can let their guard down now. They, you know, they got the shipper, they got the paperwork exchanged and the loads are just going to start flying. And the reality is they're not, right? The number one objection, the number one concern that you are having is trust. There was a point in that conversation where they trusted you enough to set you up as a vendor. But now it's a day, a week, a month later and they're realizing, well, I've never shipped a load with this guy. What if something goes wrong? Okay. Because at this point, they haven't hurt any of their customers. They haven't done anything that their boss is going to be mad about. So the reality is the biggest thing you're missing is trust. One of the things that I would do is I would use social proof. Okay. I would use a testimonial, a recommendation from preferably a shipper, but if you don't have a shipper, then you can use that from a carrier as well. And so the reality is testimonials, recommendations, reviews, those are social proof. The old saying, right? Jeffrey Gittimer, when you say it about yourself, it's bragging, but when someone else says it about you, it's proof. So I would leverage social proof any way I could, right? Um, that's one thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I would try to meet them face to face. If they're local or they're somewhere where you're going to be able to take a trip and meet other prospects, a face to face encounter will build trust. Okay. When they see you face to face, you always trust somebody that you meet and shake a hand over uh, personally versus just a voice over the phone. Okay. So that's another thing you might do. Um, the third thing you might do is. Um, you know, there's different things you can do, right? I mean, I'll give you an example of something that I've done. Um, and most of you wouldn't risk this, but I was very confident in my capabilities. I would tell, I would tell them, I'd say, listen, I know based on the fact that we haven't gotten a load from you in this lane since quoting and agreeing and getting set up, that you have some concerns of whether you can trust me. I'd acknowledge it. And I can understand that. So in an effort to earn your trust and to earn your business, here's what I'm willing to do. I will provide you a 100% guarantee that this load delivers on time. Yep. 100% guarantee that it delivers on time. Now I'm doing this to earn your trust. It'll be on the first load only. But if I don't deliver this load on time, you pay zero for the load. That's how confident I am. That's how confident you can be. And that's why you can trust me. Now, I use that be only in situations where I am very certain that I'm going to be able to pick up and deliver load on time with, in good condition with no problems. Okay? So the reality is, is that you shouldn't be quoting on lanes that you don't have confidence in. Okay? So if you don't have that level of confidence, you probably shouldn't be quoting on the lanes anyway. So the reality is that's the expectation. And if you really want to win their business, something like that can really push somebody over the edge. Now, you only do it on that first load and you explain that, right? 
but you do it as, as in an effort to get their attention, to differentiate yourself and to alleviate that issue of trust. Okay. So I hope that helps. Uh, Harvey has a question. Say that the shipper used your example of their not bringing on new brokers due to a double broker problem. How do you convince everyone you're not a double broker? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, there's a couple ways. One, you can use social proof, meaning testimonials from other people that you've done business with, shippers, carriers, and the like. Social proof is very powerful. We just talked about that in a, a, a recent question. Um Another way you can do that is you can show them your history, right? You can show them you don't have any freight guard reports. You can show them that you don't have any uh, TIA watchdog reports. You can demonstrate the fact that, that you're not on those lists, right? Uh, another thing you can do is you could explain and dive deep into the process of how you prevent double brokering, right? Right. So you could talk about your vetting process. You could talk about the software and technology that you use. You can talk about your SOP, right? Associated with vetting a carrier. You can talk about your contractual terms that protect them. You can talk about all those things as a way to alleviate their concerns. So that's how I would do it. I would use all of those things, any of those things as a way to, um, as a way to get over that, uh, overcome that. But when they say, you know, we're concerned about double brokering, I would probably ask the question, okay, so double brokering is pretty broad. What exactly are you concerned about and why? Oh, we just had a recent situation where the load was double brokered and it delayed the shipment being delivered for a week or uh, the broker had to come back to us and ask us for more money because the load was kind of hijacked until they until they paid them. They couldn't get the delivery. So there's these these scenarios, right? So um, you know you need to understand the question better. So ask a few more questions about what it exactly it is, and then address those issues specifically, and and very poignantly and very laser focused on those issues. And then you can use the. If this, then, you know, if I would you, right? That's the old clothes that I love to use. If I could make you feel comfortable with the fact that we're not going to double broker your loads and that your loads will not be double brokered, would you be willing to give me an opportunity? That's what's called a trial close. And when they say yes, then I just pick apart that, op I pick apart that objection. I pick apart that concern. I destroy that objection and then I move forward. So I hope that helps Harvey. John has an interesting question, says, as a startup, what team framework do you recommend we use or is it a one-man banjo at first? Most freight brokers are one-man banjos when they start up and that's all you need. You don't need to hire a bunch of people. You don't need a ton of technology. You don't need to spend a whole bunch of money, okay? Um so, yeah, I think that, um, yeah, it's usually a one-man banjo. If you do decide to hire people, okay, for whatever reason or at whatever point, what I would recommend as a small broker or as a small agent, you be the sales leader, you acquire the customers, and then you'll cover those loads. And when your capacity gets to the point where you can't do both, you can't prospect and serve, then you hire somebody in operations to help you serve. They learn the business and then you sell into their capacity and you can continue to add operations people because they're easier to find and train than salespeople. And then eventually one of those operations people is going to want to become a salesperson to make more money. And if they have the skills and the attributes that you can migrate them into sales as well. So that's a basic scale model for you starting from a one man banjo. Good question.
Okay, so Samaj says, my bad. My main question is, what about high volume, low margin freight? Have you ever experienced anything like that where you're making 30 to 60 loads, but you're shipping 15 to 20 loads a day? Yeah, we had lots of customers that did 10, 20 loads a day. Sure. Um, does volume of loads with a shipper uh, have an impact on your rates to that shipper? Yes. If you're moving one or two loads a week, your rate might be here. If you're moving 10 loads a week, your rate might be here. If you're moving 20 loads a week, your rate might be here. It's just basic logic that that lane is going to be more competitive with more demand, with more competition. So you will likely have to sharpen your pencil. So the reality is if they're, but the fact is, is that most shippers are not going to commit a certain volume to you in the spot market. It's kind of, uh, you know, kind of a wink handshake of, hey, there's 20 loads a week and, you know, but you may not get 20 loads a week. So the reality is when you first start out, um, you know, I would quote it as you'd normally quote it. If they ask you to sharpen your pencil based upon a volume guarantee, then maybe you want to make adjustment to your rate. But the, here's what I wouldn't do. I would not, as a broker or an agent, work for 25 or 50 bucks a load, even with volume. Zero chance, wouldn't waste my time. There are too many other opportunities out there where I can make 100 to 200 to 300 bucks a load with less hassle, less bullshit, okay? So I would not do high volume lanes at very low margins, $25, $50. I get this question all the time. Should I get the load? Should I, should I do high volume loads for 50 bucks a load? I wouldn't. That's up to you, right? The only exception to that is if it becomes very, very easy, you've got dedicated carriers on it, it's maybe a short haul. It's something that doesn't have a lot of complexity. There's not going to be a lot of issues. There's not a lot of babysitting. So maybe something like that, I might do 50 to 75 bucks a load with high volume. But in the normal course of events, absolutely not. My minimum is 100 bucks on a load. If I can't make 100 bucks, then I'm not providing enough value to that shipper. And therefore, we should probably not do business. Okay? So yeah, that's my general rule. Within two weeks after forming my LLC, I got carriers wanting on board. Before talking to my first prospect, is this something you recommend as adding value through conversations when calling? Um, as a broker, depending upon your niche, but here's how it worked for me. I'll give you my example. When we started brokering, I decided specifically on Northeast outbound van freight. If it picked up in New York, PA, New Jersey, all the way up through New England, and it was going west or south, that was my niche. Okay. So what I, I knew my niche specifically. So we did two things simultaneously. We were both calling shippers and carriers based on the load board, knowing that they had available loads. We knew the primary lanes that we were going to need to cover things like Boston to Chicago, right? You know, mass to Ohio, mass to PA, mass to New Jersey, mass you know, law, we needed some long haul carriers going to California, right? We needed some going to Texas. We needed some going to Florida, right? We needed some of those major destinations. So we recruited carriers into those specific lanes as we were making calls to shippers. So we didn't wait to call shippers. We were simultaneously calling carriers and shippers. But the majority of the time we spent was prospecting shippers because we knew that the carriers we needed to recruit the carriers we needed to source and find were specific to that shipper's needs. If it picked up in Maine and it was going to, you know, and it was a carrier out of Buffalo and they wanted to get back to Buffalo, me calling a carrier based in Ohio or calling a carrier based in Atlanta didn't make any sense because my demand was Maine to Western New York. So I needed to find those carriers. So we spent our time focusing heavily, probably 80, 90% on finding shippers and then a smaller percentage of our time just sourcing carriers into primary lanes. Now, we obviously talked to a lot of carriers based on specific lanes that shippers gave us to quote because we were in the spot market and we needed to understand what the cost of those lanes were. So I hope that helps. Okay, so if you guys want a copy of the cheat sheet, 
let me give you a link. Is that correct? Freight broker bootcamp. Okay. Freight broker bootcamp dot cold. You can download the cheat sheet. Download, download my notes absolutely free. Okay. That will be the top 10 cold calling tips that I just shared with you in this live. Um, if you guys are curious about becoming a freight broker, you can check out freightbrokerbootcamp.com, offer a 60 day, 100% unconditional money back guarantee. And if you guys are interested in getting on the wait list for the freight broker sales accelerator, right? Which is that freight broker sales coaching program. You're going to go to freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash wait list. Listen, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm excited that I'm kind of back in the saddle here. I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to give you guys some great trainings over the next month. Um, make sure you um, hit the like button, share the stream, let other people know. Truly appreciate it. Like I said, 90% of our, our customers come from word of mouth. Um, we've trained over 10,000 students. We're excited for 2024. We hope you are too, and we're here to help. Have an awesome day. Have an awesome week, and I'll see you next week on the next Freight Broker Bootcamp Live.